Should you trade faith for reality? This is the interesting question that I've pondered a good bit. It's a choice that I made many years ago. I decided after having been reared in Tennessee, in uh, I think the three biggest influences were Mennonite. That was a community I was reared in. Um, and we went, uh, we went to churches with a whole range from horse and buggy, no electricity or running water, kind of like the old order Mennonites, um, all the way up to, there were Holdermans there who they would have cars, uh, but they would take the radios out of them because that was too worldly. There was a, there was a group that we didn't uh, hang out with, but nearby we called them the black bumpers, Mennonites, black bumper Mennonites, uh, and the black bumpers, they would have cars, but they felt that the chrome uh, bumpers, and this was in the 70s and 80s, uh, when cars had chrome bumpers, they felt that that was too flashy and worldly. So to make it more plain, they would spray paint the, the bumpers black. So there's a wide variety of Mennonite types there. And, uh, and then I guess the second most influential group would be the uh, Southern Baptists. And this was... Uh, a very uh, unsophisticated group of people for the most part. Uh, These were small little communities. Uh, I would guess that a congregation, you know, when the whole place was completely full with 50 people, I would guess that maybe one person in there might have attended any college at all. So they weren't stupid people. They just hadn't gone to formal scholastic uh, universities, et cetera. Um, so that, that would be the second most influence. And then the third would be Seventh-day Adventists. We uh, went to a number of those churches. Now, all of this was happening before I was age 16. So I was with my mother. Uh, there was not a, a father in the picture for any of my life uh, until I was 21. So uh, I was reared in a single parent, uh, very poor uh, home. And I was the only child. So I tell you all of this background just to kind of give you an idea uh, of the perspectives, the the biases that I might have as I explain uh, this thought that's been on my mind. So I started going to college when I was 18, I think, or 19. And this was my first introduction to a formal uh, concept that maybe there was not such a thing as uh, supernatural real beings like gods, deities, and and just uh, to use the correct words, uh, superstitious or superstition means believing in uh, things that are not real or provable or scientific. And that's kind of theism is the belief in a supernatural being. And in the case of Christianity, which was my background, that would be God, Jesus, etc. Now, there's there might have been a historical guy named Jesus that said a bunch of stuff, but the thing that would make him a, a god or a deity or a theo would be if he was supernatural, not just like if he was a really cool guy that said some cool stuff, like Jordan Peterson says some cool stuff and some dumb stuff, but he says a lot of cool stuff, but he's not a god. He's not a Theo. Nobody thinks he has supernatural um, characteristics. So I first realized, or maybe falsely, maybe truly, I first came to to know that some people really, truly, intellectually had thought stuff through and thought there weren't gods. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is an interesting possibility. And by the time I graduated college, uh, this is junior college, uh, so by the time I was finished, after taking a women in religion class and a, a women's studies class, and uh, the the nice woman who taught it was just, she was awesome, um, and you know, she had short hair and wore comfortable shoes, and, and that was neither here nor there, but that was my first experience with um, a person who was not heterosexual. So I kind of realized, oh, wait, she's really cool, and she's really smart, and she has these cool ideas that I'm not familiar with. And, uh, hey, that's kind of cool. And so that was my introduction to other kinds of thinking. Um, 
then I spent the next, you know, from age 21-ish up until, I don't know, for probably 10 years or so, not really knowing or caring much one way or the other or thinking about it, about whether or not there was a God. I would say I, at that point I was agnostic. Like I, I didn't really know or care or it just wasn't even something on my mind. Like I had never heard any proof of a God uh, or of any deity, anything supernatural. So I, it was just kind of not on my mind. And then I would say the last probably 15 years of my life, I have really thought more about it. And I thought back to the hundreds or thousands of hours of instruction I received in private Christian schools, um, in churches, you know, going to services once or twice a week. I recall at one point when I was 14-ish, I think, uh, I was part of a church and I, I and maybe three or four other really strong adherents to religion uh, in that 14 to 22 age range. We had our little youth Bible study. So after church each morning, uh, each Sunday morning, most of the youth would go up on the hill to play volleyball and we would stay in the church and we would study Bible verses and sing hymns. And so I was like really into it at this point. I had been uh, saved, which is what the uh, Southern Baptist folks, I think there are probably some other uh, uh, Christian religions that b believe in this or sex or whatever. Um, uh, so I had been saved. In other words, during an altar call, I had gone up to the front and they had given my, my soul and my heart, my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, at this point, I was really into the stuff. Okay, so here we are now. Now, current day, I'm, I'm recording these thoughts as I'm driving, thus the lousy audio quality. And it is 2023, and uh, here, here's where I stand at this point. I have seen no evidence that the supernatural exists. Each time I have said that to a person who believes in the supernatural, they have said, oh, we have lots of proof. And then they don't provide any valid, logical, reasonable proof. And then I, and I, you know what, I shouldn't say they all do. A few of them say, no, it's a faith. Christianity is a faith. It's not something I can ever prove to you. It's something you have to feel. It's something you have to believe absent evidence. And those people I 100% agree with. Faith is, as I define it, faith is something that you believe in despite a lack of evidence. So if I say that uh, right now I'm headed to work and uh, I'm going to be back in about nine hours probably, I think that in this time frame, my wife will not have sex with another man or woman. And I don't have faith in her fidelity today because I have evidence. I have proof. I have a long history of her not going behind my back to have sex with folks. So I don't have faith. Now, if I had just met her three minutes before I left our house, <laughs> then I wouldn't have over 20 years of evidence and good reasoning to say, hey, she has never cheated on me before. I don't think she's going to cheat on me today. There's a high probability that she won't. So I, I do not have faith in my wife not cheating on me. I have confidence. And it's based on reason logic, evidence, um, I, I think to a very high probability, she is not going to cheat on me. Well, that is not faith, as I keep saying. So what is faith? Faith is believing in the unproven, the unprovable, etc. And that is, I believe, exactly what religion is. Now, maybe there's some religion out there that isn't. 
uh, faith-based one, but I'm talking about the biggies. The one that I'm familiar with uh, is Christianity. So I'll, I'll mainly stick with that. And I think uh, uh, Judaism and, and uh, Islam, uh, those are similar. I, you could probably put them in the same, what's it called, the Judeo-Christian uh, category. So this kind of what I'm saying includes all of those. I'm not all that familiar with Buddhism or what are some of the others, Jainism. And I know there are thousands of religions, but I'm not as familiar with the others. So when I see someone who says, I believe in things that I cannot prove to you scientifically, and I choose to believe in this, it makes my life richer. It makes my life just better. I go into life with this confidence that my God is going to keep me safe and that if he doesn't keep me safe and my family safe, if he decides to kill them in a house fire, because he is all powerful, all knowing he can control everything. If he chooses to kill my children in a house fire, then he has a good reason for that. And I have faith that it's, it's okay, I'm not going to be upset with him, he knows more than I could ever know, and that was probably a really cool, groovy choice that he made, I support him 100%, my faith doesn't waver. That is a perspective, and I think the system of non-science is a lousy system, but that's my personal subjective preference. My personal subjective preference is to live in a, in a worldview and to think in such a way that I get rid of as much subjectivism as possible. Now, there are going to be some things that are subjective. Uh, the favorite flavor of ice cream, whether you like a, a tall sexual partner or a short one, whether you like to have thrills in life? Do you, do you like to ride a bicycle down a hill really fast? Or do you like to sit on a couch and eat potato chips? We all have these subjective preferences, and I think we can each back them up. And I could say rationally, I don't want to risk having a broken arm or broken leg from riding a bicycle down a hill. So therefore, I am going to do the safe thing and sit on my couch and not go out and risk that. And that's my objective argument however the quality is of it. And then the other person would say, no, I don't want to die of diabetes or heart disease uh, later in life. So I'm going to go out and take the moderate risk of a broken arm or broken leg, which will easily heal so that I don't have a heart attack because I'm 80 pounds overweight at age 50 because I've been sitting on the couch eating potato chips. So there are different arguments, but they're, they're reason based and the quality of the arguments might be different. But those, those would be reasonable ways to uh, think about life. The quality is different, but they're both reason-based. The way that wouldn't be reason-based would be to say, well, I'm going to do whatever the Bible says I should do. And if I do that and I follow that, there's a supernatural being that is watching and knows and will reward me with a heavenly, literally, uh, forevermore future if I do what uh, he says, and as I understand it, and my pastor understand it, and by the way, the way we understand it is the correct way of understanding it, um, well, that's a different system. That's a faith-based system instead of a reason-based system. Is it wrong? Should I search out, seek out friends of mine who believe in faith-based uh, feeling, I'm not going to call it thinking, but faith-based faith -based feeling and say, hey, you should be a reason-based thinker instead of a faith-based uh, feeler. Well, can I objectively prove that one is better than the other? It, uh, maybe, but that's, again, it's a quality thing and uh, we have different values and we have different uh, comprehensions of reality, different perceptions of what reality is, whether or not reality exists. And I subjectively choose to believe in reality. However, it would be begging the question if I say, well, reality is real, 
and so is reason, and that's how we should think, because I use reason to deduct that. Well, no, I can't. That's not fair. Just as a faith-based person who says, Jesus loves me, this I know, I know this because the Bible that says that Jesus loves me told me that Jesus loves me. Well, yeah, obviously, this is absolute departure from logic, from reason, but that's a person's choice. And I can laugh at them. They can laugh at me. We can both say, oh, I can't believe, man, like, I love you, man, but I can't believe you believe that crap. We can say that back and forth to each other. And he can say, how do you not realize that God is real and that he loves you and that he wants you to live forevermore in his kingdom? How can you not see that? Didn't you see the beautiful sunrise this morning? Like, how could that exist without God? And then I could argue right back and say, man, I can't believe it. How can you not believe in science? Like, didn't you see the sunrise this morning? Like, that had to be from the humidity in the air and the, the sun reflecting off of the humidity at a particular angle with this kind of you know, wind current or whatever it is. How can you think that that's a supernatural thing? And we can both be incredulous and have fun joking around about how silly the other person is to believe in what they believe. However, it's, it's cool with me if they believe that. Now, here's where the danger exists. This would be my one argument, potential argument, for why I, as an agnostic atheist, should search out people who are feelers, who, who are not reason-based thinkers, and I should try to convert them to my way of thinking, or to the reason-based way of thinking. And that would be, if I was a central planner, and I said, I looked at the numbers, and I said, how are most uh, bad things that I subjectively think are bad, like uh, homicide, genocide, uh, rape, uh, all of these things, is there a particular group of people or a, or a particular way of thinking or feeling that leads to this? And let's just say that I looked at the uh, last 500 million deaths in the world, and I said, huh, of those, isn't it interesting that 450 million of them were at the hands of people who, of, of the 20% of people who believe in the supernatural? Well, that's scientifically, that's a, something that stands out. And he goes, huh, well, I don't know all the reasons behind it, but this is worth investigating. And if I then investigated it and, and put, you know, good reason, good science, scientific method to, in examining this, then maybe I could say, okay, it does appear that a person who is a Christian is much more likely to wage a holy war, or a person who believes in Holiness is more likely to wage a holy war than someone who is not, and lots of people are dying from holy wars. Therefore, you know, if one out of five Christians is going out and, and participating, supporting war, holy wars, then yeah, if I have five Christian friends and I can persuade them all uh, to be thinking people instead of feeling people, then yeah, I'll get rid of one more proponent uh, of holy wars, or there will be one less proponent of holy wars as a result of my uh, persuasion. Well, in that case, it would be worth it for me to do it. However, I don't think that Christians and Muslims and Jews, and I would say those are the three most violent religious groups uh, or, or types of religions that are, that are most violent. In other words, a, a Jainist extremist <laughs> who cares? Like, they're not out hurting people. Um, a Muslim extremist, Christian extremist, a Jewish extremist. Well, yeah, there's been a lot of bloodshed the last hundreds of years. 
and, and you know, I can kind of say, okay, if it's a violent one, um, that's, that's scary and worth looking at. However, even among those three most violent religions, I don't think there's been a, a huge amount of death and mayhem caused by them. Not enough that I would target those people to try to get them not to be faith-based. Um, I, I think my efforts, if I looked at all the horribleness that happens in the world, I would say that religion is probably number two in guilt. Number one would be the belief in authority, in government. That has caused way more deaths uh, based on what I understand, to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that militaries from primarily secular uh, governments have been responsible for far more death and destruction and, and mayhem and injury through violence than have uh, religious folks. And, there, you know, we can talk about the Christian Crusades. We can talk about Islamic uh, folks who actually have not that high of a death count. Uh, we, we could talk about those, but I don't think that they are materially, scientifically significant from a scientific examination standpoint. So I'm hesitant to say that I need to go out and change people's minds for that reason or open them up to a new way of thinking. So this, this brings me back to my pal, Billy Joe Bob, the Christian. Should I try to change him, get him to give up faith and go for reason and logic? And I would say no. And this comes to mind because I have a, a handful of my top 20 business associates and friends I have a handful of people who I'm, I'm pretty darn close to who are Christians, and they also make their primary living in the religious industry, uh, like by being ministers or uh, teachers, whatever, in faith-based organizations. So should I really go up to Billy Joe Bob and say, hey, you're making a comfortable middle-class living doing what you love and what brings you peace and happiness in your life? Um, let me tell you something, have a seat here. Let me prove to you that there is no proof of any of this stuff that you're building your life around. And then hopefully if you think about it for a few days or weeks, you'll then go out and quit your job, get rid of your income. You'll quit going to church. You'll quit saying silly things to your friends. And now you're going to live a rich and wonderful life. Uh, are you kidding me? Like, do I really want my friends to do that? Probably not. Now, having said that, if a friend comes to me and says, hey, I, my whole life is wrapped around my religion. However, I have an open mind and I want to believe as many things that are true and I want to disbelieve as many untrue things as possible, that is a higher goal to me than my financial security and my emotional security, stability, feelings. More important than, than those things is, is just knowing truth, understanding truth. And I know, and I'm not worried that if I lose this job, I will find another way to put bread on the table. That's not a concern of mine. I want truth. Okay, well, that person, yes, I would love to have conversations with them. That would be wonderful. And they might, you know, with that kind of an open mind, they're probably going to be able to tell me some things I have never thought of or heard of. And who knows? I mean, that would be a very good conversation. On the other hand, the person who's just minding their own business, believing whatever they want to believe, nope, I think I'm going to. I think I'm going to leave them alone in what I consider to be delusion. Their delusional thinking, as long as it's not hurting anybody directly, they're more than welcome to do that. 
and th there's a good chance that they are using reason and science in most areas of their life. You know, when they build a, if their ho hobby is woodworking, when they build a, a table, well, they're not using faith there. They're using logic and reason and, and physics. They're using science to build the table. Uh, they don't say, I feel like this table should only have one leg and it should be at a 90 degree angle. Well, no, they are saying, let's look at past evidence. What we need a platform on which we can put our plates and our food and our glasses. And so it has to be sturdy. It has to be flat. It has to be this size. And huh, as it turns out, three or four or more legs coming down from the table, certain type of support system makes the makes the table more sturdy while still allowing you to put your knees under it and scooch your uh, belly or your chest right up to the edge. Huh. This is just, this is reason. This is using things that are, are not faith-based, like a, a tape measure um, to, to make de smaller decisions as we, as we build this table. Um, so the people who are using uh, emotion, uh, faith, superstition in one or two areas of their life, they're not using it for most of their life. They're not driving based on faith because they get in wrecks. They're not building tables based on faith. They're not uh, making financial decisions based on faith, I hope. Uh, I guess some of them are, the lottery ticket purchasers. Um, but for the most part, people make decisions based on reason. And that's completely cool with me that they have a couple areas in their life that they don't do that. And when they say something, you know, when I say, ow, that hurt, well, I'll pray for you. Or, yeah, my aunt is in the hospital, well, I'll pray for her. Uh, am I going to be rude and say, shut up? Well, no, they're, they're trying to say, they're not thinking. They, they are so used to saying and, and thinking that praying for somebody is doing something of value. And they are not trying to get into a conversation of me explaining that, you know, take two people with broken legs and get a, uh, a thousand people to pray for one of them and nobody praying for the other one. And, huh, isn't that interesting that the, the result turns out to be more based on science, natural healing, how good the doctor was, blah, 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 uh, the scientific reasons, uh, reality-based reasons. They're not asking for this conversation. They're not asking. And I, I, they're trying to be nice, and they're doing it in a silly, delusional way. But I'm not going to call them silly, and I'm not going to call them delusional. They are welcome to be as silly and delusional as they want. And if they're being kind about it, then I will grin and bear it. Now, I'm not going to say, please pray for me. I'm not going to encourage it. I'm not going to say anything to be intellectually dishonest uh, based on what my conclusions are. Um, if they say, would you like me to have my church pray? I'll say, no, uh, but you're welcome to. Like, if that makes you all feel better, you're welcome to. I don't think it's going to have a material difference in this, in my aunt's sickness, but y'all are welcome to do whatever you want. So that's kind of my thinking, my my final conclusion, I don't mean final in my life, but at this point in February of 2023, as far as my thinking shows, I, I haven't been persuaded that there's a good reason to screw up something good, even if it's a delusional faith-based thing. If it's overall doing good in somebody's life, making them have a happier time on this big spinning rock, I don't want to destroy their happiness, even if it's silly and doesn't use the logic system that I like. Am I off base or do you think it's good of me to live and let live? What do you think? <laughs>